Thanks for joining us. I'm Diane Rehm. Gail Sheehy's best-selling book, Passages, gave people a new way to understand the crises and stages that punctuate adulthood. In her new memoir, the journalist and author reflects on her own life's passages from the moment she first faced her own mortality to the years spent caring for her dying husband. Her new memoir is titled Daring My Passages. And Gail Sheehy joins me in the studio throughout the hour. I'll invite you to reflect on your own life's passages. Give us a call, 800-433-8850. Send us an email to drshow at wamu.org. Follow us on Facebook or send us a tweet. Gail, it's so good to see you again. I'm thrilled to be with you, as always, my favorite interviewer in the world. Uh, oh, Gail, you're sweet. I want to talk with you about what finally made you decide to look at your own passages. Diane, I think I, it's only fair. Um, I've been interviewing thousands of men and women and examining their lives and collaborating with them on putting together the story of how they grew. And I thought when I passed into my 70s, I it was time to turn the lens on my own life and see how did I make my choices? You know, what was my pattern? What did my life add up to? Uh, that's a tough question to ask yourself, but the 70s is a time to do it. And I would encourage your listeners to do it in their 60s or their 70s, even if it's only for their grandchildren. Indeed. You talk early in the book about your mother and dad. Mm -hmm. Tell us about them. Well, they did the best they could. Uh, my mother was um, a woman of her generation. She had tremendous uh, ability as an, a potential opera singer, as a businesswoman. She wasn't able to accomplish either of those because of the deprivations that women suffered when they came of age in the in the 30s and the 40s. Um, so she became an alcoholic, unbeknownst to me during childhood. She just would kind of disappear like a cloud and she'd come and go. Uh, she was wonderful when she was there, very sunny presence. She was um, the one who made my ballet costumes and gave me acting lessons, but she really wasn't very supportive. You describe a scene in the book where she is upstairs in the bedroom hidden away. Mm -hmm. I think you're about six. Right. And you say you go in there and it smells like some kind of medicine or right. mouthwash and yet you know now it was alcohol. Exactly. And she used to have what she called um, sinus attacks. So she'd make a wonderful meal, serve it, there'd be the three of us at the table until my the baby sister was born nine years later, and then she'd disappear and say, I have a sinus attack because she'd been drinking while she was making dinner. But meanwhile, your father was downstairs with other women. With other women, his golf partners, so to speak. Is that what he called them? Yes, and I would often see them through the banister upstairs and see them wrestling on the ground as if they were just horsing around. And sometimes I would call my mother and say, you know, Daddy's um, playing with his golf partner. I want you to come. You know, or Daddy's on the phone with, you know, his golf partner. And Mom wouldn't come. She would be drinking to escape the reality that she did not know how to fight. And pretty soon they were sleeping separately. You right. were dealing with each of them separately. Separately, yes. And my father at the time was um, training me to be a competitor which was very useful later in life. Uh, he was the, the man behind my swimming suit with the gun, the starter's gun, uh, having me race in uh, meets, national and I mean, county meets. Uh, and most often I won. And as long as I won for him, everything was great. If I didn't win, he wasn't so happy. Uh, and sometimes he would switch my legs with forsythia branches. So I really learned that you had to be a winner. How long did they stay together? Really not until um, I was 21 and I had 
uh, or 23, I had married, I would come to New York uh, on Fashion Week <laughs> as a reporter for a Rochester newspaper. It was the most exciting outside you know, story I'd had and I, I had a deadline every day and I really wanted to make it and my father appeared and insisted upon coming to have lunch. I said, I don't have time, Daddy. I, I'm, I'm on a deadline. He came anyway and he dropped the news that he was marrying one of his golf partners who was younger than I and going off to California to start a new life. And but your mother? And, oh, by the way, my mother wasn't going to be going with him. Uh, so it was an enormous uh, shock to me. And by then, you were already married. I was married. Thank goodness I had uh, a foothold in uh, an independent life. Um, but the biggest problem was, and I had to beg him and actually insist that he continue to put my my sister, my much younger sister, through college. She was only in her first year and struggling to pay the bills because he really wasn't paying much attention. He promised he would, but I knew by the end of our conversation that was not going to happen. It was not going to happen. So did you have to help your sister get through college? Not only have to, I wanted to. Uh, I So I actually within a couple of years had two surrogates, <laughs> two, one natural child when I was 25 and my sister who was kind of my surrogate child and fell into the drug culture, you know, having had her life blown up and the drug culture in the Lower East Side, which is where we lived, was just wild and amphetamine was the drug of choice and she got mixed up with a, a man who said he was running the grand magic vitamin experiment and bringing in all kinds of uh, 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 children to be his slaves, so to speak. And she finally got caught um, passing false credit cards and was put into the Women's House of Detention, a notorious prison at that time, and was released in my custody. So now I had a second child and had to find a babysitter for my first. And the, the funniest, one of the funniest chapters in the book, Diane, is call it called, um, you know, Woodstock. Because I had to escape this maniac who was had power over my sister, who came to find me in order to find her and tried to kill me. And I, the only thing I could think to do was to just get out of town. And I went and got my picked up my sister at the drug program where I had installed her. Uh, we drove up to this big gathering up in some farm in upstate New York. I knew there would be thousands and thousands of people. Nobody could ever find us there. And it turns out to be Woodstock, the biggest drug fest in the history of the world. And we're the only ones who huh. didn't even have a pa. Huh. You were, at the time, supporting your husband who was going through medical school. That's right, I was. He, it was called PhD, putting hubby through. Uh, that was one of the um, common uh, assignments of young women in their, uh, married in, their, in, the, in the 1960s. How long did that marriage last? Really only lasted five years, mm -hmm. um, and he was now uh, in residency, didn't need the support anymore, found another lady. So it was kind of a repeat of what had happened when, with my father. And thank goodness I didn't get embittered uh, against men, but I did have to struggle as a single mother and struggle against the feeling that maybe I was unlovable. Uh, but fortunately, very soon after that, I met the man who became the Pygmalion in my life, Clay uh, Felker. Clay Felker, who had started New York Magazine in the pages of the New York Herald Tribune, where I was working as a journalist in the women's department, which but was where we boy, were. Boy, did you make a bold gesture, and that's why I love the book's title, Daring. You went to speak to Clay Felker without your editor's permission. Absolutely. If she had known I was taking my best story to the man who was putting out a Sunday supplement, she would have gotten rid of me. Um, but, you know, I, I had been watching and reading Tom Wolfe, who was the you know, the god of the times, and Jimmy Breslin, who was a you know, roughneck and, you know, would work with bail bondsmen and kneecappers and then get drunk and go across the street and insult everybody. So these guys were just blowing up journalism, writing a whole new way 
uh, we called it the new journalism. I met uh, Tom in the elevator one day, and I said, what's it like to work for Clay Felker? And he said, well, the uh, Herald Tribune is the main Tijuana bullring for <laughs> male competitive riders, but you have to be brave. <laughs> and, I said, and you were. Well, I said, you know, I'm, I'm little. But I'd like to think I'm brave. And why should men be the only one who writes like who write like that? So I got my best story, and I crossed the city room. I called it the testosterone zone, and I got to the door of Clay Felker's uh, uh, little cubby hole. He's on the phone. He has a huge voice, Diane. Uh, I'm hearing him say, "What do you mean you don't have my reservation? Three people in the pool room, my usual table at the Four Seasons. Wow." I'm standing there thinking, who am I? I'm just a little, you know, somebody, one boyfriend called me a skinny, brainy chick. And All right. I didn't now, mean it as a prep, as a compliment. Save that, the rest of that story until we take a short break. Gail, she, he is with me. Stay with us. And welcome back if you've just joined us. Gail, she, he is with me. She, of course, is the New York Times best-selling author of Passages. And now she's written a memoir about her own passages. It's titled Daring. And indeed, that is what Gail, she, he can claim to have been for most of her adult life. Now, finish that story about making your way to Clay Felker's office, hearing him on the phone. Well, he was larger than life, and his voice was could make glasses jump off the table. So I'm hearing him say on the phone, what do you mean you don't have my reservation? Clay Felker, the pool room, my usual table. I have three people coming tonight. Uh, my oh, my wife is opening on Broadway. I think, my God, this man has everything. I'm just this little, you know, nobody. And then he looks up and he says, "Where, where did you come from?" I said, "The estrogen zone," <laughs> <laughs> meaning the women's department. Yeah, exactly. I got a laugh out of him. And then he said, "What have you got for me?" Well, I knew I had 30 seconds to hold his attention. And, of course, I garbled my story at first. And then he said, well, what are you trying to say? So I finally spit it out. I said, well, it's a story about loser men who are uh, inviting beautiful women to come to specimen viewing parties because he wants to. they want to offer them free rent so that they'll sit on their beach blanket and attract other beautiful girls so they have to pick the best specimens. He said, did you go to one of these specimen viewing parties? I said, yes, of course. He said, then write it. Write that scene just like you described it. We'll call it the flypaper people. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, write a scene as journalism? I've never heard of such a thing. He was telling me to jump off the edge. Of and course. That was the beginning of, of the new course. journalism. Isn't that marvelous? Mm -hmm. Now, he was in the process of getting a divorce at the time. And as was I. And uh, actually, I, one of the chapters I called Seduction at the Algonquin, <laughs> he was seducing me to write for him. But it also turned into a kind of an interview, uh, a joint interview about 
our pain at losing our marriages. And so we kind of connected on an intimate emotional level very early, even though for many years we had a creative intimacy before we ever had a physical intimacy. Now, here's our first email from Laurie, who says, how did you come up with the idea to name your book and your thesis on adult life passages? That's a long story, Diane, but I'm going to tell it by telling you about the one of the most daring and frightening episodes in my life. I uh, insisted that Clay send me to Northern Ireland during the peak of the Troubles in 1972. Uh, the British Army was at the throats of the Irish Catholics, and being half Irish myself, I was fascinated. And Clay said, well, what does that have to do with New York? And I said, well, you know, half the population of New York is Irish, isn't it? But that's not the story. The story is the women. The women are fighting the battle because the men are mostly in prison and the women are even shooting British soldiers. He said, well, that's a story worth telling. So I go over and it all happened so fast, Diane. We were, I was following a peaceful civil rights march, beautiful sunny Sunday afternoon. We did all the things that you're supposed to do. We met the soldiers at the barricade. They threw their tear gas. We vomited it back. Then we were dragging people dented by rubber bullets back to a square. People were greeting their neighborhoods. And I crawled up in an outdoor staircase in order to get a better view. I'm standing next to a young boy and I'm asking him, how do the power troopers fire their gas canisters so far? And this young boy is saying to me, well, see them jamming their rifle bullets on the ground and all of a sudden a bullet just smashes right into his face oh, and my gosh. it was so shocking I bent over him I wanted to put him back together because I was young enough I was only 32 I thought everything could be put back together and this was my first experience of how brutal the world can be uh, and before I had a chance to do anything a man fell in on me and said move crossfire and there were IRA sh sharpshooters on the roof British paratroopers were flying you know, just plunging into the crowd, shooting, jumping out with black gorilla masks and high-velocity rifles. Somebody had to crawl out in the crossfire to get us taken in, and I wasn't about to volunteer until a bullet just passed a few feet in front of my nose, and I watched it as if it was in midair, just Gosh. suspended. And, and then I did bang on a door. We were taken in. Uh, and 13 people were massacred, including people being, you know, protected by a, a priest with a white flag. I got down uh, on the ground afterwards, and an IRA commander came over and said, I'm sorry, Les, I'll have to confiscate your film. And I said, but you're not going to take my tape recorder because it was open the whole time. And he said, good, Les, I'm going to have somebody take you up to a safe house. So I got protection, but mm. I got to a safe house mm. up in the bog side, the Catholic ghetto, the British Army was making house-to-house -house searches, kicking in the doors to find IRA. This woman who owned the house was playing the prison song at the top decibel on her Victrola to be defiant. And I said, well, what are you going to do if the soldiers come in here firing? She said, lie on me stomach. <laughs> so I asked if I could make a phone call. She said, yes, one. I called Clay. He's in New York in bed at night. I said, you know, he said, how's the story coming? I said, well, you know, it, it's 12 people were murdered here today. He said, well, how did that happen? I said, well, they're calling it Bloody Sunday. He said, well, I'm, I'm watching it on CBS News right now. And I said, Clay, it's really bad. He said, honey, just stay out of trouble. You don't have to be in the front lines. Just stay with the women. It's a women's story, right? Ah! That was the first time Clay didn't hmm. get it. Hmm. And I just felt alone. Uh, I went back and uh, got on my stomach until I could drive across the fields in a car to get to the Republic uh, And in the morning. And I thought, you know, there's no one with me. There's no one who can always keep me safe. And that was an insight. Um, I, that was the end of childhood, the end of adolescence, the beginning of an adult recognition of how uh, uh, chaotic, how random, and how brutal the world can be. But where that led to my idea for passages was, I went back and I read a lot of interviews that I had been doing for a book called um, The Private Lives of Couples. And a lot of the people were in their 30s, in their early 40s, and they often had a kind of a mortality, uh, a sense of mortality, time running out, need to change, 
uh, disequilibrium, and they hadn't had a traumatic event like that, external one. It was coming from inside. It was something that happens in the late 30s and the early 40s. That was my insight. So I began examining adult development and talking to the scholars who were looking at it, just a few of them. Uh, and that led to the most important book that I ever wrote. Passages. Passage. But when I told the editor finally in our last meeting before he had to go to print, and he said, what's the name? What's the name? Closed my eyes, and this name just suddenly appeared to me, and I said, Passages. And he said, they'll think it means excerpts. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, not when they read the book. Exactly. And boy, what a book. Just so insightful for all of us, no matter where we came from, no matter what our growing up, no matter what our background, somehow we could all connect through that book. I was thrilled that so many men uh, were absolutely. Uh, impacted by that yeah, book. That absolutely. Uh, just because a woman wrote it didn't mean that it was for women. So now taking a good look at yourself. Would you describe your passages as being sort of clear delineations or did you find yourself looking back and putting them into clear delineations? Well, I did have to, you do, you have to wait until you get through a passage before you know it for what it was. Exactly. Because when you're going through it, you just feel a sense of disequilibrium, dissatisfaction with some of the, something of the course that you had been previously following, which may have been the perfect course for that time. But now the fit feels different. There's something left out. Um, you, you, you develop more uh, self-awareness. Uh, you develop more compassion for others, and you these passages when you are moving from one stage of growth to another, you have a chance to make a real leap of growth, a real or leap of creativity, uh, or productivity. But you also may drop back. You know, some people regress and uh, don't come out of you know post adolescence until their fifties. You. Talk in the book about the arithmetic of life. What do you mean? Well, when I uh, had my mortality crisis at 32 and wrote the book at 35, um, I had this interval that was saying to me about the you know you've you've lived half your life because at that time 70 seemed old, uh, and you know what about the part of you that wants a second child and a home? Well, that wasn't going to be possible with Clay, but he was the man I was in love with because he wasn't ready to have a child. Uh, and what about the part of you that wants to make a change in the world? You know, demonstrations and, uh, you know, some articles, that's not enough. So I was challenged to take a leap of growth, and um, that's what I tried to do. And you did. Well, I, I did it at 35 when the book passages was published but that puts you into another whole orbit the whole kind of um, disequilibrium of suddenly being a known person mm. I had thought that it would sink without a trace Diane that was why um, I even let a, a, a psychiatrist who was competitive with me and tried to Tried to, you know, tried to poke at my biggest doubt, which was no one will take you seriously because you're just a journalist. He wanted me to be, he wanted to be my collaborator, and I said I don't really need a collaborator. You can write your own book, and I'll write mine. So he sued me to try to enjoin publication of the oh book. Oh my gosh! And of course, I it was there was no that. basis for it whatsoever. It was a ridiculous nuisance suit, but I wouldn't have been able to proceed on finishing writing. I had run out of money. I had to finish this book just to get my measly little last advance. So I said, well, just give him 10% of my royalties. It's not going to mean anything anyway. Uh, and that was the price I paid to finish the book. Wow. But That's quite a price in order to 
put him out of your life. Well, it was a pretty daring move, but yeah. if I had written the book with him, it would have been an academic book. It wouldn't have been accessible. Gail Sheehy, and you're listening to The Diane Rehm Show. Speaking of psychiatrists, here's an email from Kathy who said, I've read Ms. Sheehy's book since Passages. I've loved and used her insights. When I, says Kathy, was an active psychotherapist, I recommended that book to many, many people and often receive back their gratitude. I also especially valued her book, The Silent Passage, mm. about menopause. Mm -hmm. So glad she's still writing. You know, that was one of my proudest books because at that time, and this was... Uh, this was 1990. People I would say. still didn't want to talk about Not, it. Nobody, even mothers, didn't talk to daughters. Girlfriends didn't talk to girlfriends. I remember when I went on <laughs> on the road to talk about the Silent Passage, and men would usually be sitting where you were, the new news, and suddenly they'd be presented with this woman who's going to talk about what. <laughs> <laughs> And one man said to me, uh, you know, said, well, um, menopause, is that like uh, impotence? And I stopped for a moment and said, really? no. Uh, I said, but uh, let's see, baldness, is that like Alzheimer's? And it made him laugh. And he realized that he was way off the beam and we were able to talk about something that affects every woman. And, you know, here's another uh, little daring thing I did. I followed Hillary Clinton into the ladies' room at Renaissance Weekend one time. Uh, would have seemed pretty rude, but she was ready to let down her hair. She was being blamed for the Democrats' defeat in the 94 political by-election. And she said, I just don't know what to do anymore. Everything I do seems to go wrong. And then she confided that she was in menopause. And she thanked me for the silent passage. Huh. And that started me on following her and Bill Clinton for 10 years for Vanity Fair and writing a biography of her, Hillary's Choice. So it actually turned out to be a very good dare. Are you still in touch with her? Well, she is not in touch with any journalist. She's come to really abhor uh, the press, as many presidents and presidential uh, contenders do. Uh, but she is so carefully guarded. It's very, very difficult to get do through. Do you regard her as a possible presidential candidate? Or not? Oh yes, I, I I think she's I think she's very conflicted, but I think she will ultimately go conflicted. Why? Well, you know, if you listen to her interviews, uh, she often says when they ask, you know, how will you make the choice, and she'll say, well, you know, I have a very nice life now. She does. She's a jillionaire. She can. Uh, she has a bully pulpit wherever she wants to go in the world. She any cause that she would put her finger to, people would follow her. Uh, she doesn't have to go through the, the slime that she will have to go through as a presidential candidate, which will take down her very high level of esteem around the world for some time. She will have to go through that again, and as would any uh, presidential candidate. And how do you see Bill in that scenario as an asset or something else. Oh, I think he's a tremendous asset. I mean, I think they are well beyond the uh, difficulties that they had. They're just not, you know, they've put that form of their relationship to rest. They have always been one another's most uh, valued confidants. They've always talked multiple times a day. Bill Clinton knows a great deal about the world. So does Hillary Clinton. And he, he's always her, if not her first, one of her most important uh, sounding boards. So we'd again get two for the price of one. Which was his thing. Yeah, exactly. Way back when. But I think this time we, uh, the American public would see more value in it because he's a man. So you think she will run? I do think she'll run. I'm not sure she has the fire in the belly that we want to feel from someone who is running for president at the age of 68, given what she's been through. Gail Sheehy, her new book, 
is titled Daring My Passages. Short break here. When we come back, we'll open the phones, take your calls. I look forward to hearing from you. National broadcast of the Diane Rehm Show is made possible in part by Constant Contact, offering a variety of tools like email marketing for small businesses to promote themselves online at ConstantContact.com. By the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, helping NPR advance journalistic excellence in the digital age. By the Walton Family Foundation, whose K-12 initiative works to empower families with quality school choices. WaltonK12.org and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. This is NPR. On the next Fresh Air, with the campaign season officially underway, veteran media consultant Neil Oxman takes us inside the world of campaign advertising. He'll talk about responding to attack ads and how the flood of money since the Citizens United ruling has changed the business. He'll also play us some ads he thinks were particularly effective. Join us. And welcome back, Gail. She he is with me. Her new book called Daring. It's a memoir. She subtitles My Passages. You have something called a daring project going. Tell us about that. Well, you know, Diane, I wanted to excite younger women to be daring. Uh, this is a very perilous world we're running, we have now. We are recovering to some degree from the economic disaster of 2008, but jobs are still really tough, especially for young people. And uh, so the, you know, the natural instinct is to try to grab onto something safe, be set, get into the corporate world, take something secure, although there's not much that is secure, even in corporate life. I want to encourage young women to be daring. That's really the default position now because with the digital age, people do experiments, they try something, it fails, and only after it fails two or three times are they able to actually get something that works. And how do you want them to be daring? Well, um, let me just give you, I'll give you a couple of stories. Um, one young woman was at her freshman year at college, her best friend uh, wanted to go to Cape Town, South Africa as a, as a dare. But her friend was killed in an automobile accident, tragically. So the young woman left college, told her parents that she wanted to go to Cape Town, South Africa to, to live it out for her friend. <laughs> she did, and she dared herself to learn how to surf. She'd never been interested in surfing, but she wanted to see, you know, could she master this? And she'd always been able to get A's and do very well. She tried like the Dickens. She wasn't able to master it. She was able to do it and did it for six months, lived with girls from around the world, uh, having a wonderful experience of independence. But she found out she didn't die from failing to accomplish something and get an A. And that was the biggest uh, growth spurt in her life. She came back, finished college as an art major, came out and said, you know, I, I really like to write. So she dared to go into writing. She's now in the middle of writing her first novel. Great. How will people get involved in this project? Well, I have a website called SheHeDaringProject.com. It's very colorful. It invites women to send in a capsule of the most daring moment in their lives. Um, it doesn't have to be even such a big thing, like you know, getting a nose ring when your mother tells you absolutely it's a no-no, and standing your ground. 
uh, and taking your first independent step. She, uh, he, daring project dot com. That's it. And it'll be on our website connecting to yours. Good. I do want to remind our listeners we are video streaming this segment. <clears throat> so you can see Gail Sheehy as well as hear her go to DR show at WAMU.org. All right, let's uh, open the phones here. Let's go to Rochester, New York. Simeon, you're on the air. Good morning, and thank you for taking my call. Certainly. So this week and last um, will be remembered by thousands of 18-year-olds as the passage time in their life when they began college. Mm -hmm. But tragically, at the same time, for other 18-year-olds, it will be looked upon later as either the beginning or the continuation of a period of life when, for various reasons, especially for males, they were incarcerated and enmeshed in the criminal justice system. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering, do you account for, in your theory about passages, the difference of, in the passages pe people experience because of socioeconomic and other factors? Mm -hmm. Or do you see passages as sort of being similar across cross-cultural lines? Well, they certainly are experienced differently mm -hmm. uh, depending on one's socioeconomic statuses. And, you know, I'm very, very concerned about young men today. Uh, you've mentioned one group of them who, instead of being able to pull up roots, which is what that adolescent passage is about, to take your first independent steps, and those who have the uh, opportunity to go to college kind of boomerang back and forth between being very independent in college and then coming back home to you know, feel the safety and security of uh, being attached to mom and dad and then go out and take another bigger step. The young men in, in incarcerated, if they're in, you know, a decent prison and they learn a trade, uh, with, with if they're able to uh, grasp something that they wouldn't have gotten on the outside, they have a chance when they get out to make an independent life. But it has to be, we, we need vast improvements in our prison system to make that possible for so many young people. And let's go to Fairfax, Virginia. And Manny, you're on the air. Yes, um, thank you. I, uh, Ms. Sheehy, I just wanted to uh, really, uh, I can't thank you enough for your work and the insight that it's given. I, I kind of quote you all the time. <laughs> thank uh, you. I'm now approaching 80. Uh, I've been in a men's support group for a long time, and just the, the whole concept of the changes we've gone through, I found so valuable. And I, again, I, I kind of quote you all the time. And uh, the challenges change before, uh, during working. Uh, what did I accomplish there? And then one retires, mm -hmm. and you do you, your life's work. And the things that particularly now are hitting me are, I guess, three issues. One is loss of loved ones. We go through our parents dying. Yes. Uh, my spouse is also aging, mm -hmm. coming to terms with my own death. Mm -hmm. A role uh, versus adult children, how that's going to change. Mm -hmm. And I also I, I volunteer in a, in a nursing home as an ombudsman. And mm -hmm. I really kind of see that, the difference it makes, and even the, the concern, will I be in that shape and will I be able to accept mm -hmm. it with, mm -hmm. with, with great grace? And one thing that ties into all of this is something I read the other day in an article. Uh, it's probably it's on Jackie Robinson's tombstone. It says, a life is not important except in the impact it has on other lives. Well, that I certainly would endorse. Um, I know both Diane uh, and myself have lost our husbands, uh, and that is one of the greatest uh, passages in life. Uh, I, I was fortunate in that my husband took 17 years uh, to uh, wrestle with cancer four different times, and in between we had victories that made us feel almost invulnerable. Um, but it gave us a, a, a new lease on life, a, a much deeper relationship, much more empathetic, much more tender. Uh, and for me, in many ways, it was a gift. Uh, my husband, Clay Felker, had been my uh, my uh, mentor, uh, even in some ways my Pygmalion. Uh, and then when he began to decline physically, and as a result, his career went into decline, I was able to give him 
kind of the gift of a bonus life. Uh, we moved to California. Uh, we helped each other find a new uh, niche for him. He was able to start a magazine writing and making program at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, which gave him uh, the opportunity to, to bring to life uh, new talent and train some of those who are the new journalists of the next generation. How and, did his dying process change you uh, and your work? Well, it, it, I, I was amazed to write when I <clears throat> was doing the memoir to find that in the last 10 years of his life, <clears throat> I wrote five books. How did I do that? I, I don't know, but but it was uh, by uh, putting uh, yourself down in that chair and forcing yourself, forcing to myself write. to do that because I knew what I knew and what I tried to say in my book Passages in Caregiving was, you will only have the role of caregiver for some time. You will not follow your loved one into death unless you give up your own life and your identity and too many caregivers do you have to survive so that there is an identity there is a purpose to life after you lose the role of caregiver and it, it took me uh, at the most herculean effort to follow that through but once I did and actually it came around by the doctor saying to me Hillary Clinton has asked you to go follow her campaign in 2008. Why don't you go? And I said, how can Indeed. I possibly leave Clay? Indeed. And he said, we'll have a meeting at his bedside and get his blessing, and we did. And you went. And I went, and it was the best thing I could have done. Absolutely. Let's go to Padma in Jacksonville, Florida. You're on the air. Happy Wednesday, Diane. Happy Wednesday, Gail. Just what a pleasure to talk to two of my favorite people. Thank you. Thank you. Um, mine is just a very, very simple, um, sort of, it's almost just a rumination of mine. Just, Gail, from your perspective, um, with your thesis of passages and now with Daring, where does um, introspection, the idea of letting go, and um, sort of embracing the big picture, how does that interface in all of your thinking and the delineation of passages? Well, letting go is, is actually the act that one has to allow in order to let a passage happen. Uh, letting go of what you've been ha hanging on to, the, the channel that you've been in, the, maybe the, the marriage that has turned sour or has been empty for a long time, the career that may have been something you, were, you felt you should do, but now you find out you're 35 and you don't really want to be a lawyer. Uh, or you don't really, uh, you know, like living the corporate life. Um, so the idea of letting go of what has kind of died for you, going through a little death and coming out the other side with room and excitement about the new, the, the, the new possibilities for yourself. That's yeah. the whole process. And of course that leads me to wondering what's next for you having finally written about yourself and your own passages. Well, Diane, as I'm traveling around the country, I'm asking people to give me their daring moments and their daring stories, and I think that will probably produce a book of its own uh, because they're coming in all different shapes and sizes. The other day, I had a petite woman with gray hair uh, who was asking me to sign her book, and it turns out she was a com command sergeant major in Afghanistan who'd made a hundred drops. <laughs> and wow. here she is, this little tiny thing, and I thought, wow. wow, there's a daring dame if I ever saw one. I should I want to know say. more about her story. So that's one thing. Um, but I want to get back to journalism. I never want to leave it. I, you know, have, I would love to write about Vladimir Putin. I don't think I'd like to be killed for it, the way a couple of women who have written about him seem to have uh, met that fate. But I think he's the most fascinating and the most terrifying of the actors on our stage today. So you would like to interview him personally? It's a dream, <laughs> but you never know. You never know. And actually, I never got to interview Gorbachev himself, but I interviewed everybody around him, including his propaganda chief, and I certainly learned 
enough about him to write uh, a pretty uh, uh, ex uh, ex extreme story because at that time nobody knew anything about Russian leaders. They've never known anything about their personal life or their character or what they really thought. And at that time, Gorbachev actually thought he was being driven crazy on purpose by his antagonists. And I learned that from his propaganda. So have you asked for the interview with Putin yet? No, not yet. You have not. Well, I'm involved in something else right now, but I will. <laughs> I would think it would take some time. It will take some years. Yeah, but indeed. And you're listening to the Dan Ream Show. Here's an email from Rona. Please ask Gail to give us some advice on the meaning of life after 70. After 70. Well, you know, I, I've kind of given these simple little um, phrases for different stages, like the tryout 20s, when we're really trying ourselves out in the relationships. And I think of it as the, the thrilling 30s, because we have no sense of uh, an end to life. We think that everything is ahead, and it is. And then I call it the flourishing 40s, um, but it can also be the forlorn 40s, because we do have the first intimations uh, that there is a place where it ends. And if we haven't succeeded in our original dream, we may feel like failures, but that's the beginning of the next thing, of letting go and finding the next thing. I call 50s the flaming 50s, because I think of women you know, jumping out in with postmenopausal zest, doing things very often, entering politics, starting their own business, you know, doing something totally new because they're quite free at that time. I call the 60s the selective 60s because we have to really select what's most important in our lives. We can't do everything. And that we have to make some hard choices, which is why I think Hillary Clinton called her book Hard Choices. Uh, and the 70s I call the sage 70s. I think we really know as much as we are going to know about ourselves and about the world at that time. We have a great deal to give back in whatever mm -hmm. way. I meet so many people in their 70s who are writing poetry, uh, who are writing their first book, who are writing a memoir, uh, who are giving talks, who are giving workshops, who are life coaches, in many ways finding the way to give back from their own experience. I want to add to what you've said and say directly to Rona, my late mother-in-law who died at 92, called the 80s the best years of her life. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that something? That's wonderful. I mean, she just kept on going and enjoying art galleries and being with people and moving around. And, and the 90s became a little more difficult, and that was that. But looking back on the 80s, she truly enjoyed them. Well, it can be the exhilarating 80s. <laughs> and it sounds You've like it already was. thought of it. <laughs> I think that's just great. Well, I had the feeling that when people have an opportunity to read about your own life and the passages that you have gone through to come to this point in your life, where you're ready to be pretty open about yeah, it's, just, it's very frank. And I, I talk about some daring, uh, dumb dares that I did. I even talked about <clears throat> eloping from college three weeks after I started. <clears throat> I called on the way home with my bow and to tell my mother I was eloping with a surgeon. And she said, is that McCarthy? I said, well, yes. And she said, he's a tree surgeon. <laughs> I said, I know, Mom, but anyway, can I talk to Dad? She said, well, your dad can't come to the phone right now. He's looking for his shotgun. Oh. <laughs> I did get accepted back to college, and uh, as a result, I was so grateful for the education that I got <clears throat> that I became <clears throat> a born-again virgin. Good for you, <laughs> Gail Sheehy. Her latest book is titled Daring my passages and it is indeed a memoir congratulations gail thank you 
I love being with you and I hope people will go to the Shehi Daring Project and contribute their stories so that we can dare other women to take daring choices. Indeed. And thanks for listening all. I'm Diane Reed.